Okay, and here we are recording. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, can everybody um, please mute themselves uh, if they're um, if they're not talking? Thank you very much. Awesome. So uh, we're back. We're back. Uh, welcome back to the back to the Sal study course. Um, thank you very much. First of all, for it continue. Thank you very much, Kel and BD for uh, doing the wonderful things that you did last week for everyone um, while I was away. Beatty did all the work. All I, I just got to uh, throw shade without being recorded. It was great. <laughs> now you can throw shade while being recorded today. There you go. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, w welcome back again, everybody. Um, as you know, um, this Back to the Cell Study course um, is uh well one of the things we're starting with at least is taking a look at the getty and a lot of the things that we miss um when we're uh, just training on the south floor because as we know there's quite a distance between the text and the manuscript and what we end up doing in drills and in class and um, we're doing this in preparation for our return to the south in uh, 2021 uh, hopefully 2021 and so thus far, this is like our 18th, 19th, 20th week or something crazy like that, um, going through uh, the Getty. Um, in this particular uh, part of this course, you're getting principally my view, although uh, more and more uh, these last weeks, um, other senior members of Emma have um, uh, wonderfully been able to join us. And so um, where they have opinions and things, you're also hearing from them. I would like to um, make a special uh, call out this week to our founder, uh, who is with us today, David Svet. Um, so welcome, uh, David, a very big welcome from all of us, and thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting. Yeah, uh, it's it's great to have you here. Um, uh, and, and yeah, so um, so that's uh, that's awesome. Um, what else? What's my usual spiel? It's only been a week. Oh yeah, and so um, because you're uh, you're getting. Uh, principally my view and those of the senior members of course it's important for you to remember that um, you know our views are just one of many and we don't want you to believe something is so just because we said it we want you to be convinced by the same evidence that we're convinced by and we want to encourage you to make the study of the manuscript part of your experience with Fiore um, because it is not complete without it and so with all of that said, um, let's get into it today. So it's been it's been two weeks. So just to briefly reprise, we've been dealing with the sword in two hands section um, for a number of weeks now, a good number of weeks, because it is collectively fairly large. Um, we began with the guards, uh, which comprises um, both the first six images, um, these six unlabeled as it were um, unlabeled guards along with the this big paragraph here with footwork and with the two LaDonna uh, figures so this this section begins with this image here and then one two three four five six six guards which are dissimilar from one another as the text says and then we have 12 guards which are all labeled with this red labeling uh, either uh, pulsativa stabile or instabile and that comprises the guards of the sword in two hands. Then we have a, a folio with the cuts. Then we have an introductory little preface. And then we have the Largo section, the Strato section, and then finally the, um, the last master of the sword in two hands before we move on. So this week, we are probably smack in the middle of the Strato section. We might even finish it today, depending on how things go. So we're almost through, as it were, we're almost through. Um, last time we talked, we made it, I think, a good deal of the way through the strato section. Thus far, um, we, we, we started off with this first master of, of strato. A lot was said um, on, these, on this first master and uh, what the nature of strato is and what we're doing uh, here in strato in comparison to um, what... Uh, the Largo play is like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've had lots of great theoretical conversations and, and um, technical conversations about that. So we're not going to have any of that today. That's recorded and in previous sessions. But we started off with, of course, laying the groundwork for our understanding, um, not least 
is remembering that though we just did the Largo section in the sword in, in two hands, much of the book that we've studied so far, having started at the beginning of the manuscript here, has been something to do with Abrazari, right? The Abrazari section specifically, of course, and then Dagger, and then much of the rest after that is still concerned with Abrazari. And so here we are again um, in the Strato section, though we have swords in our hands, we're now um, we're now about to see more Abrazari, except of course with um, with swords. And so thus far in the Strato section, we've seen a number of things. We've seen grabs to the hilt. We've seen pummel strikes. We've seen um, uh, grabs from behind. Um, we've seen various various different grabbings of the hilt, depending on. Um, the situation, right? What the crossing is, what your openings are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we've seen this really cool sequence of plays here, and, and actually that's what we finished with last time. So this really cool sequence of plays here again is one where the uh, the attacking uh, scholar pushes up uh, un, uh, with his quillins underneath the hands of the of the enemy. Oh, sorry, I'm referencing the wrong person. This guy's the attacking scholar in this case. <laughs> Uh, he's pushing under the, uh, we're using his quillens, pushing under the hands of the enemy, um, bringing the hands up, then wrapping the hands with a, a double uh, middle key, and then beating him senseless, or maybe doing this play, which we had fun talking about last time, uh, as, to, as to what it is. And then, um, yeah, and then now we're here at Folio 29 RC. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments or things that they wanted to bring up from previous sessions? Just open the floor wide open. No? Okay, um, great. And lastly, before we get into it, um, as always, if you do have a question or comment, please say something. It's likely that if you have a question, five other people have the same one. So don't be afraid to, to ask anything. There's no stupid questions or, or, or observations. And um, yeah, so let's get into it. Folio 29RC is where we're starting today. And here's the text. And can we have Alex, would you like to start us off? If someone parries on the reversal side, grasp his left hand and his whole pommel with your left hand and push him backward, then you may strike him with thrusts or cuts. Thank you very much, Alex. Okay, so if someone parries on the reverso side. So this is a really neat, um, neat play for us to start off with, actually, because uh, you guys know that we've been principally trying to focus on the Getty, right? In, in the, these Monday sessions, um, unlike the, the scholar uh, sessions on Wednesdays, these Monday sessions, we're more trying to get a narrative through. We're not really trying to look at every single controversy or, or interesting point um, that that you could that you could see. But in this in this case, there's something in another manuscript that we're going to look at for comparison, um, and that is and that is from the PD. So the text in this play says, if someone parries on the reverso side. And the astute of you will know and remember that the first master of Stretto, if the if images mean anything, right? If images mean anything, the first master of Stretto is not crossed on the reversal side, right? They're crossed with their true edge um, facing their left side, whereas a crossing on the reversal side should be the opposite. It should be a crossing where the true edge is facing your right side. So. Without knowing anything, that text should be curious to us. But as it happens in the PD, um, da, 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 da. aha, in the PD there is a third crowned master in the sword and two hands section, and this third is this is um, PD Carta twenty three BB, and um, this master is curious because it's a master of the reverse crossing. And this master is uh, missing from the, well, I say missing. This master is not present in the Getty version of Fiore, and it is in the PD. And why this um, m matters for us 
is that it helps us understand and contextualize the text of this play and arguably some of the plays that follow. Um, I think I would have probably end up making that argument as well, that some of the plays that follow work better from the reverse crossing. Um, but I, before we continue, I just wanted to, to, to call attention to that, okay? So, but this is what the reverse crossing looks like, okay? So you see the crossing is with the, the true edge facing the master's right as opposed to their left, um, as opposed to, um, excuse me, as opposed to the first master of Strato. So now that we know that, we can um, look at the play. With the reverse crossing, with the reverse crossing, the, oops, the, um, why does that matter with this, with this particular play? It matters because the, uh, where's my mouse? There it is. It matters because the, uh, the enemy's sword, the, your Zugadori's uh, sword is going to be crossed like this, right? So your, your sword is here. This is, this is us right? With a reversal crossing, our pommel is going to be more towards our right side, and their pommel is going to be more towards our left side, okay? And this, this allows us an opportunity to do this particular play, because that means their pommel is kind of more directly in line with our left hand, right? And our left hand is the entry hand, right? We've talked about this a bunch in Strato before, except for one play, maybe two in the Strato section, the left hand does the entry, does the principal entry action. And so if this, um, if this crossing was reversed, if we were crossed on the right side, then the enemy's sword would be more towards our right, right? Or the enemy's pommel would be more towards our right, and we wouldn't be able to push it um, in, this, in the same way. We'd have other things, right? But in this case, one of the things the reverse crossing potentially allows us is an opportunity to push their pommel. Um, the other caveat is obviously the crossing has to be um, of a certain kind, right? So the pommel uh, or the um, the swords need to be more upright than um, what's what's a better way of describing it? The Going sword up, hands down. Yeah, but like the 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 points the points need to be more to the sky than to your face, right? If the if the points when they're crossed, if the points like this, you see, if the points are more in your face, how are you going to push the pommel? Right, you can't. The pommel's kind of kind of hidden, right? So if the crossing is more vertical, right, then you have the opportunity if you stretched out your hand to get underneath that pommel and a and a push it. Um, so it's not just the the side of the crossing; it's also, of course, the place where the where the pommel is. But I would imagine that stands to reason, right? Um, so, but that's but that's basically it. Uh, you know, the the particular situation is un, you know is unique. It's it's got to be its own thing. But uh, pretty simply, it's just a, a pommel push. He's obviously kind of checking the sword there, and freeing his sword so that he can continue with cuts or thrusts, right? And here's another example of a strato play which doesn't end in wrestling necessarily, right? Just because we're in strato doesn't mean our swords can't work the way that they're intended to do. And so here's a situation where we have a strato entry, but the finishing blow could very well be made with the the point of the sword or with a cut or something else. All right. Um, anybody else want to comment on that? I'm not sure where I picked it up over the years, but I like to think of that one from the PD mm -hmm. uh, as right cover. It comes up somewhere in a, mm. either a previous translation or, or something. And it, to my mind, it just sticks right cover mm -hmm. against the reversal side. It's, it's easier than uh, for people that are more new to it. If you're covering on the right, it's right cover. 
Yeah, I think that it's a shame that the Getty's missing it because uh, in, Stratto makes a lot more sense if you're giving a master of cover of a covering from the right and the left because the opportunities for plays I do vary significantly. I find so having two masters kind of makes it a little more obvious. But the Getty doesn't have it. What do you do? Um, okay. So is it an yeah. artifact of the? Mm -hmm. Is it just an artifact? No. Uh, is it just an artifact of the image, or do you think he means to have the left leading leg of the scholar that far to the left of his opponent, which would means that he's taken a step diagonally forward to the left and changed his center of attack to the left, to the right side of his opponent? Absolutely. That's a, a great question, Bruce. Um, I would say, you know, broadly speaking, it's sometimes difficult in Fiore to to determine the intent of the 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 depth of the image. You know, we, we've had debates about this before in, in other plays. In some plays, it seems obvious. In some plays, not. Um, I agree with Kel that it would definitely work well in this case, but whether or not that's indicated by the image or it just happens to be drawn in the way we see it i'm not sure no. i'm i have absolute confidence in that because mechanically if you reach across on the entry you make a slight uh, trans uh transversing slope step and you reach across it clears your sword from the bind on his sword and drops it into the center because you've checked his pommel and mm. now your sword can come loose. So that step off to the left, that, well, crescimento off to the left clears the center line for your sword to come into the play. Whereas it was stuck in between the center of the two of you, you've now created a new center by pushing his pommel back and you've got an open, clear line to attack him. So as far as I'm concerned, the art is accurate here. I mean, when we get to the point where you're looking at art, you can see the thumb and the fingers. I, I think foot placement's pretty pretty clear. Hmm. Yeah. Well, like I said, I definitely agree that it works well with a little um, a, a little uh, w w the passing step. Obviously, is key, um, but uh, a little traverse to the right, uh, the left as well. Yeah. Great play. Um, it's a great play. You don't see it too often in fight nights because uh, having the swords very upright um, yeah, is not too common for us. I think we're all pretty scared of uh, hill grabs and, and, and pommel pushes and things. Yeah, this is something for a common fencer. You're yeah. Not, you're not going to pull it off against an experienced fencer. Yeah, absolutely. Well, easy for me to pull off because I've got the reach. <laughs> That's right. You so good, we have yeah, good point there, Dave. We have a giant here, everyone. So let's remember that all that theorizing we did about slaying giants, we can now um, we can now ask the uh, ask the giant uh, himself. Um, he will give his opinion to us puny humans. Yeah, humans. and uh, puny humans. Yeah, and after he's uh, after he stops going, oh, oh, oh. Oh, you know, then then he'll he'll comment. So just wait after till after the the bellowing. Anyway, um, <laughs> all right, Folio twenty nine R D is where we're next. Uh, here we go. Andrew, would you like to read a text for us, please, sir? Okay. If someone parries from the Mandrito side, grasp his sword with your left hand as shown and strike him with the point or with the edge. If you want, you can cut his face or neck with his own sword, as you see in the picture. After I'm done striking you, I can leave my sword and take yours, as the student after me will do. <laughs> oh, that classic Fury sass. All right. So this hey, is a, this is a fantastic one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is one we've seen... Uh, um, I wouldn't say regularly, but more regularly oh, than no. you'd think in, in fight nights. Um, so it's a sword grab, right? This is a sword grab. Check it out, right? We spent, a, um, or at least I made a big deal about sword grabs in the Largo section, um, given the two, the two plays that we saw, um, with sword grabs in the Largo section. Um, and I, uh, used those plays here 
25 VC and VD. I used those plays to try and argue for uh, or argue that this reveals something about the nature of Largo and principally that it needs to be sprightly and um, full of movement to avoid the near occasion of sword grabs because they're they're terrible. They're terribly good. They're terribly good and ba bad for you, um, good for the enemy, and um, we don't want them, right? we gotta, we got to keep our sword moving. So you might ask, if that's true, therefore, then isn't that a massive problem in Stretto with uh, having having blade grabs? And the answer is absolutely. And here's the play for sword grabs. So he says very simply, from the Mandrito side, okay, so back we are at the Mandrito side. Um, grasp your sword with your left hand, as shown, and strike him with a cut or thrust. Very simple. Okay? So if the sword's in your presence, all the things we know about sword grabs apply again. Right? Grab it and, you, again, use the sword the way, in the way that, that it's intended. Just because we're in Stretto doesn't mean we can't use the sword uh, in the way that it's intended. So grab it and strike him with a thrust or cut. And also, if you want, you can cut his face or neck with his own sword, as you see in the picture. This is a little more interesting. We might say a few words about this. So um, what I definitely think he's trying to illustrate here is he's trying to illustrate that even if the opponent tries to wiggle the sword out, tries to move the sword and his body in a way that breaks your, that he's trying to break your grip or, or whatever, you can still use that sword offensively in the left hand. You know, it's not just a, a little light uh, check, right? You can you can do some, something with it, right? And in this case, it kind of seems like the guy is maybe trying to um, do a volta stabile, maybe rise up to a finestra or something. Maybe he's trying to pivot away, you know, he's doing whatever. Texas stage, right? Uh, a Cobb's traverse. He very well may be. Yep, he very well may be. Uh, but regardless, do you see that the uh, the hold is uh, uh, the hold remains. The check remains on the sword. And f for my money, there's only one. Uh, there's only one response to sword to, to blade grabs. If you can't really book it right and in strato of course you're not free to leave so in this case he has to go in right the moment that grab happened his only safe exit was to smash the distance away between these two people and go right into abrazar to prevent that sword from from uh, having the space to be used because now he's he's screwed right he's not safe to leave he's not safe to stay he's he's in trouble um, and yeah, you see Fiori talking about you can use the sword to cut his own neck if he's leaving. Yeah, sure, why not? I guess if he's that kind of dumb, um, then then sure. And then he says, after I'm done striking you, I can grab your sword too. <laughs> so as a student after me will do. Okay, so this one, nothing that we didn't already know, but great confirmation of all the things that we've seen and looked at um, just previous. So awesome and with a little Fiori sass as well. All right, and then there's this guy. Uh, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, so like, at what point uh, is it still like safe to grab the sword? Excellent like... question. What do you think? What's your instinct on that? Well, probably when it's not moving, but the word like parry uh, implies that there's oh. like, some kind of motion. To grab, well, sorry, to what? At what? At what point is it safe to grab the sword? Yeah, well, he, like the whole movement is a sword grab, right? The whole right. play is a sword grab. So, like, uh, but he says when someone parries. Um, so, is right. this someone just like, winding up to do a parry, or like right. I'm just uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's an it's an excellent question. Um, my understanding is that the the, the conventional answer is when the sword is at rest. When it's not moving now that 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 could be for an only an instant but if you can grab it in the instant that a sword is not moving then you've grabbed it in the right time whereas if the sword is moving it is generally unwise to attempt to grab it if you value your fingers First, like a pommel, you, like the, the previous play you can do when there's some kind of motion going on right well the problem with with motion is that 
you know, motion is something which is suited to Largo, right? Largo things move all the time and shift, but because you have space, you can calculate, right? You have space to make up for the motion and to figure out what's going on. In Stretto, there's no time for anything. Same in Dagger, right? So if the thing that you're trying to act upon is freely moving around, you're in kind of trouble, right? Um, you you would rather it not be that way if if possible. So so even with that pummel uh, push play that we saw, the instant that you go for that pummel, it needs to still be there. You know, if the sword is moving around a, a ton and if the person is changing the bind or changing positions, then it's just as much uh, it's just as possible if you go for that pummel push play that the pummel will just not be there. You know, rather than him like even trying to, to mess you up about it so it's it's tricky right it's tricky and pushing things grabbing things they they tend to need to be uh stable at least for an instant but when you do it um otherwise it's much more difficult i have two things to add please as far as it not moving uh, you don't want it coming down you don't want to mm. put your hand into something that's coming down Mm -hmm. If you manage to pause it momentarily in a bind of some sort, and, and I hate, I really dislike the word parry in, mm. uh, in Fiori's terminology because he uses coverta, which is not specifically parry, which is turning your edge into a bind. Uh, coverta means a moment of deflection or a moment of, of pause, but it doesn't necessarily mean the swords are stuck. It can, but it doesn't necessarily. So when you think of it in terms of setting it aside and yet still having contact with it, your edge is gliding towards uh, their flat from their edge where you, you know, made your for an incidental contact. This is an oblique cover, right? It's not a parry because if you were parrying, they'd stop and then you start again. So, and second thing is, if the sword is going down, but you've slowed it, slowed it slow knit down with contact with your sword you can chase it with your hand the most important thing to remember is you are not grabbing the thing like it's a stick it yeah. has two edges on it yeah. you're pinching it with your palm and when you look at the fingers and how relaxed the wrist is of the zugadori or you know whatever uh you will always see some uh relaxation it's never a tense pulled out all the way type of thing where he's trying to twist it away and i see this quite a bit uh where fencers will grab a sword like it's a stick and try to twist it out of the other player's hand you know would you ever think of doing that with a chef's knife just from one hand to the other <laughs> no that would be idiotic so why would you do it with a sword that's much more efficient at cutting than a chef's knife is and way longer and more leverage. Well, especially so, if you're grabbing the first third, which is the sharpest well, part. Uh, well, um, that's a, an argument that can be left for another day. Sure. <laughs> uh, because, the, for example, the, the early 15th century Chateaune swords were found in a, a barrel in, in a river, uh, and uh, they're all sharp all the way down to the cross. Sure. Yeah. After 500 years. Hmm. So, anyway. Um, my point being for the original question was, number one, you don't want to grab something that's in motion unless you're following it. If you're following it, you can catch up to it without harming yourself. And the second thing, the most important thing, is that you're not grabbing it willy-nilly. You're mm -hmm. pinching the flat. If you don't pinch the flat, you don't have as much leverage against it because the palm of your fingers or your hand, depending on which direction your thumb is, uh, really can lay against the flat without any risk and you can chase someone around the room holding onto a sword this way because i've done it numerous times it's not that hard but you got to have quick hands yeah. so i mean if you really don't think you have quick hands then you know learn to do card tricks or juggle or something because that's the kind of eye hand coordination you need to have in sword play you get it in Abrasari, you get it in dagger too Anyways, please continue. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kel. Uh, did that answer your question, uh, uh, Alex? Yep, thank you.
Awesome. All right. That's a fantastic question. Um, and, and it's not obvious. I, I did a presentation once for the scholars where I, I babbled on at length about this thing. And I, I tried to make a, some sort of analogy to like a snake where, you know, you're, uh, you're fencing in Largo, right? Everything's going normal, but you have this snake that's coiled in your, in your left hand, right? Um, especially in, in this case, you're, you're fighting with swords and a sword in two hands and yes that that left hand is along for the ride but it's it's a coiled snake and it's waiting for a largo moment where the sword of the enemy is at rest and in your presence and as soon as that happens it comes out or like a chameleon's tongue or whatever analogy you want to use it comes out and and, and pinches that 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 blade and and again you're only doing it if it's in your presence you're not you're not you know doing huge footwork to try and chase this thing you know moving while it's in the middle or whatever it's just a to it's a totally situational thing but if they make a mistake and put it in your presence then adjust uh, motion of the hand body with a very quick extension to posa longa you know or frontali reaching out that's all it takes and that can change everything so it's great to practice it's another thing to practice when we get back to the cells um all right Folio 29VA, this is the continuation of the previous play. Um, Beattie, would you like to uh, read the text for us? Yes. Thank you. My sir. play comes from the play of the student before me. I cut the opponent's face with his own sword, sending him to the ground. I'm going to show you if this art is good, but. <laughs> yeah, I like the second edition translation yeah. better. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I'll show uh, you how real this part is. Yeah. What a, this guy's such an asshole. I think he gets sassier as the book goes on. Um, hey, so, he survived 60 years, you know? Yeah, you know, apparently you get a little uh, a little grumpy when you survive 60 years. Um, yeah, what a strange thing, eh, Dave? <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so th this one uh, uh, puzzled me for a while, um, mostly because I wasn't really reading it. Uh, the image looks strange. Um, you know, if you're thinking about this image, like, okay, so how the hell did he get here, right? Then, you know, if you're starting from square zero and you don't remember what we just read, then it definitely can seem strange. But, you know, just like we've seen in other plays, like in, um, like, uh, oh, no, no, this is Largo. Just like we've seen here, right, these two plays, in this play we have, and hit him until you're tired or whatever, whatever he said, and then you could also do this. So we, we know from, look, from studying Abazari, et cetera, et cetera, that pain compliance, one of the principal utilities of pain compliance is that it builds tempo. It can end fights in and of itself, but that's entirely reliant on the um, other person's constitution and it's not possible to predict so it's principle um, it's it's principal utility is to build tempo and allow you to get actual fight uh, finishing plays uh, through and we've seen a, a ton of examples of this in the manuscript so far this was another one of them right where he's gonna smash the guy in the face and then he could finish with a throw uh, afterwards if you so chose here's another example where he says i can cut and thrust etc etc and and then when i'm finished what's the um after i'm done striking you i can leave my sword and take yours so i definitely read this play oh showing the code no um i definitely read this play as kind of like a bit of a brag you know after he's done cutting and thrusting this person he's going to drop his sword and take the en enemies and f fuck him up with the enemy sword too you know so great um that's pretty awesome fury he's showing us how real the the art is well all right i i hear you fury that's pretty brutal well uh, <laughs> i have uh, another thing to add there please in this particular case when you're doing it you are so close together and your crosses have a great potential to get tangled up. It's actually easier to let go of your sword and grab his between the hilt uh, because you've got a hold of the tip of, or the last third anyways of the weak of his sword. It's and if you try to move in closer to him as he's trying to escape, for example, if he's trying to pull back to his left, 
you've already pushed the blade against his neck. And if he's trying to get away from that, don't make this entry with your left hand, or I'm sorry, your right hand and your right foot. Uh, you can't do that when you've got your own sword in the way. It's easier to discard your sword and grab his hilt because you've already got the weak. So mm -hmm. I can say from personal experience, having done this less times than I have fingers on one hand, that it, it's a tangled mess when you're up close in strato. And it's a way to resolve the issue of the swords being embroiled to the point of uselessness. Mm -hmm. Because you've already got some control over his sword. Getting rid of yours and going straight to Abrazari is mm -hmm. just a simpler solution. And the joy of having someone ask you, are you killing me with my sword, is just just overwhelming. Hey, Bob. Hey, George. Are you killing me with my own sword? Um, I think I am, Bob. Oh, this really sucks. Uh, yeah, and 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 to, to to double down on that point, Cal. So something that I've struggled with the, the entire time that I've uh, been studying Abrazari is learning the right moment in Stretto with the sword in two hands, learning the right moments to commit to Abrazari fully uh, without the sword, rather than continue Stretto with the sword. And I continue to find that a very very much a moving target. Uh, it's usually my brain is either you know, all of one or all of the other, um, which ends up me, uh, with me dropping the sword too early or keeping the sword too long. And keeping the sword too long makes a mess out of this play. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it must be said that there is a time and place for dropping the sword. And, you know, the pragmatists among us would probably agree, I would suppose, that that place is whenever it's best. <laughs> So, you well, know, keep the sword if it's if it's going to help you. But if you're in a situation like this where the sword is not going to help you anymore, then get rid of it. That's it, exactly. Exactly that. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that anyone who wants to understand the moment that you need to let go of your sword, you just need to do this play a few times with a playmate. And, of course, have it done to you as well. Yeah. Because without the practical experience of trying to hurt someone who's trying to get away from you when you're this close with a, the long sword. And it becomes readily apparent when you need to let go because you can't hold on to it. Yeah. Their, their sword guard is on your sword guard and it's becoming harder and harder to hold on to your own sword. Well, get rid of it and take theirs because it's more convenient. Use theirs. I'll pull it's just off. as nice. It's just yeah. as sweet as pulling someone's dagger and stabbing them. It is... Hey, Dave? Yeah, we call that say? pulling a Frank, well, don't Dave we? Knows, Dave knows this one real well. <laughs> this, this, this is... It's one of those sweet moments that you just go, you looking for your dagger? Here it is. It really is cool. Yeah. It's Sorry, a sweet Aaron. one. No, no, Sorry, not at all. If you've never, if you've never experienced that that particular moment, it's it's one of those tee hee hee, you know, like a, the snickering cat moment in the cartoons. Yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh, well, it's I, a good I, one. I would I would argue that, that that play is almost redundant because the previous play in Polo Polo Twenty and RD, if mm. you haven't finished your your uh, Zugadora, then you did something wrong. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Sure. Well, yeah, okay, because they're still struggling. That's true. Very true, Dave. Yeah, well, I I agree, Dave. That's why I kind of I feel like this is a bit of a flex because like, you know, it's like, well, did you was this a safe thing to do? Well, if you had finished them off, then this is unnecessary. And if you didn't, then you let go of your sword and got went for his when he still had some fight left in him. So, but I don't know, you know, maybe this is, maybe he was confident uh, enough in the, in some, the art to do it. He's just, he's just trying to impress the ladies. That's all. Uh, well, well, that's uh, never really been my skill. That's a thing. <laughs> um, I've, uh, I, I've always seen this one as you didn't do enough damage to him while he was trying to get away. And this just finishes the job. Yeah. Um, people, people will really, really monkey grip their sword. Uh, you know, a lot of people aren't willing to let go of a sword when they're in the middle of a fight for fair, pretty fair mm -hmm. reason, logically. Mm -hmm. But at, there's a there's a time where the art supersedes, you know, pure strength and adrenaline. And this is one of those examples of it. 
Sure. Yeah, and we might also speculate, you know, uh, that perhaps the situation is of a sort where the person has on some uh, decent protection. Maybe he has, you know, some sort of uh, heavy leather on, or maybe, maybe he's even in some kind of armor or maybe he's in, you know, whatever. Right. And maybe, you know, you've done a little damage, but really not enough. And you're looking to finish the fight. And rather than try to hack at him in the previous play, which wasn't working as well as you wanted, maybe you built some time and stepped in for a, a throw. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, who knows, right. There's lots of situations yeah. you can, you, you could think of. Um, the previous play also shows that uh, that place in a point in the armpit. You know, true, for sure, a thousand percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's of course, that's of course true. But yeah, no, those are all the, all important things, right? And this is you know this is why I'm really glad we're doing these sessions because this is the kind of this is the kind of uh, these are the kind of questions and considerations which reveal what we're really doing here, right? It's not just the play. You know, it's not just about the moves and blah blah blah. It's not that simple. It's about the context, right? Um, and what we're really, what we're really learning. So yeah, all right. Next one, twenty nine VB, folio twenty nine VB in the Getty. And who's next on the list? Bruce, would you like to read the text for us, sir? Please and thank you. This play comes from a play of Dagger, first Remedy Master. In that, the left hand was used to disarm the opponent by placing it under the dagger. Similarly, the student here places the left hand under the opponent's right hand to disarm him. Or, he can place the opponent in a middle bind, as in the play that follows the first remedy master of dagger mentioned above. And that bind belongs to this student. Awesome. Thank you very much, Bruce. All right. <clears throat> So here we have a play which uh, we've seen many times before, um, although now it's done with the sword. So let's re recall what we looked at previously. Oh, that's the senior page. So a few, um, I think we can notice above all, um, above all the dagger masters, Fiore is referred to the first remedy master almost like exclusively. Uh, since the dagger section and even in the dagger section he refers to the first remedy master constantly and um, specifically the middle key he's constantly referring to the middle key um, but uh, here we go again with another reference to the first remedy master uh, of dagger and so in this text he talking about um, the uh, the disarm by placing his hand under the dagger of the first remedy master and he's also talking about the middle bind. So we remember that in the first remedy master, the very first play, 10 VA, we um, we have a disarm in the in the text. It describes the disarm. I can make um, here's the absolute best thing I can do: make you drop your dagger by turning your hand to the, to the left. Okay, and then of course we have the middle key at uh, folio 10 vc i have locked your arm in this middle bind so that you won't give me any grief if i decide to throw you to the ground i'll do so with very little trouble don't even bother trying to escape so we have fury referencing here 10 va and um, 10 vc in in the getty and so we look back at the image yeah we look back at the image and we see this Okay, so it's important. Uh, I'm gonna have to get rid of my. Uh, I'm gonna have to get rid of my thing. That's fine. <laughs> we see we see the image, um, and it's important we recognize that there's two things going on here. Okay, there's the there's the entry, and then there's the. Well, the sword threat, right? So um, the difference between. Uh, the difference between this play here and the plays that we saw in the dagger section is what's in the offhand, right? In the case of the dagger, the disarm with the middle key was done where there was nothing in the offhand, right? The offhand was, you know, was open, though, of course, um, we talked about in the... Not offhand, main hand. The, what did I say? You're right. So, I'm, excuse me, the, the, the main hand. 
um, it's there's nothing in it. Although in the in the first remedy master we talked about um, maybe this is busy doing things like hitting the person on the at the moment of the cover and doing you know whatever doing other things. But there's no, there's no weapon in it. But in this case there is. We have a sword here. So what we see are what we see are two things going on. We see an entry taking place against the um, the, the Sugidori sword. And we see a threat uh, being presented with the, the main hand, with the right hand. This entry, uh, there's two entries here. Uh, hey, Bruce, would you mind muting your um, your mic there? There's some white noise. Thank you very much, sir. Apologies. Um, all right. So this entry, there's actually two entries um, suggested. Um, and one of them is the disarm in the first Remedy Master. And the other is... A middle key okay so these are the two things that he suggests now why does he suggest two things well both the disarm and the middle key um, are suited to two slightly different contexts in this bind here so the disarm in order to disarm the sword you need to kind of get underneath the pommel right whereas to do the middle key you can you you can well you have to get over the arm a little bit right you have to be on top of the arm to come up and over it so um it's curious that he gives us these two options because your left hand is always either going to be underneath the pommel or over top the arm depending on the nature of the of the crossing that you're in so if you're in a crossing and you have access to his his main hand, his right hand, you either have the middle key opportunity or you have the pommel, uh, the, 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 the disarm opportunity, right? Don't even have to think about it. If your hand is underneath, if the, you know, if the sword crossing is a little high and that pommel is exposed, you can get your hand underneath there and you can attempt the disarm. If the pommel's a little low, the crossing's a little lower, you can go for the, the middle key. And you're golden, right? And while you're doing this, though these are interesting and useful in and of themselves, I would definitely say that the principal thing that you're doing here is engaging the enemy's sword so that you can present your own threat here. So I don't, you know, while this this is the entry that's going on here, um, it's to facilitate this this threat of a thrust or a cut or or, or whatever. But very cool, right? This is totally two separate things going on, one in each hand. Um, but they both work very well together. So a very, very neat, wonderful uh, exposition of our uh, dagger play combined seamlessly with our sword, our, our, our swordsmanship here. It's very, very neat play. Um, anybody have anything else to add here? Um, I have a question. I'm not yep. sure if we covered it. I had to step away for a second. Mm -hmm. But can you go over how this is different from the sixth scholar? Because I always get them confused. Sure. Yeah. So you mean the sixth scholar in uh, Strato? Uh, in um, yeah, 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 in oh. Strato, just back like uh, eight plays or whatever. I think it's on twenty-eight V, the top right one. Twenty-eight VB. Yes. Okay. Uh, great. So, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. So the the art seems similar. That's that's true. But the text, I think, ought to uh, ought ought to resolve that. So, um, fantastic yeah. question, though. Um, so after I'm crossed, uh, that so this is the text for twenty eight VB. After I'm crossed, I pass with a parry and strike your arms in this manner. I also thrust at your face. And if I perform an accrescent with my left foot, I can bind both your arms. Either this or I can I can do this play. So he does seem to suggest, and here I, I do kind of agree with the your implication, that a middle key is potentially incumbent here in 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 uh, 20, 28 VB. It depends on what he does with his arms, right? But in the text, he says, I pass with a parry and strike your arms in this manner. And I also thrust at your face. 
Um, I remember us having a bit of an um, interesting discussion when we went to this play. There's a bunch of different opinions about exactly what he means here. My reading, Graham, is that when he says strike, he's meaning um, to uh, to percussively impact the, the hilt and the hands with the back of your left hand and building a small tempo to threaten this thrust as opposed to this play we're looking at, which is um, a solid entry like the dagger first and uh, first and third plays. Uh, with There's no percussive engagement here. He's going in for the disarm or he's going in for the middle key, though the threat of the thrust is the same. So short answer, there's some things that are the same. I would say there's some things that are a little different. Yeah. Okay. Very similar. Awesome. Thank you. Can I please, please go, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the Largo play, the measure is such that you can only reach his hand with your hand. So you can smack it, grab it, uh, you know, stick your hand against the hilt, whatever. But your chances of getting any sort of grip uh, on and leverage, of course, on the uh, player's right arm between the wrist and the elbow is almost none. Now, in Stretto, the measure is such that you can easily, with a bent arm, slide it in, and you'll either connect with the wrist, if you wish, at that measure, or if he's pulling back, you dive in and you do the uh, middle key. But the inside of his right arm, against the Zugadori's right arm, I should say, is entirely open to your hand entry. Um, where Aaron sees that that particular play as more, um, say, later in the tempo, I mm -hmm. see that as uh, two images of mm -hmm. options during that tempo. See, we sure. cannot look at these images mm -hmm. as photographs at mm -hmm. a moment in time. Mm -hmm. They're stories, they're mm -hmm. tableau, right? So when you look at this play, he's showing you the option of having your hand as deep as you want or can get, Hmm. so that you can reach to his elbow, but the wrist is always available. Whereas in the Largo play, you really can't affect his wrist that much because you're so far out. Um, the best you could do would be to grab it, and then you'd be pulling at straight arm length, which is not a strong position, right? Okay, if you if you wrestle hmm. uh, at, front, at frontale versus uh, relaxing your arms a bit, uh, to a, a more medium frontal, it is a whole different uh, mechanic to it, the way you can engage your body. Whereas when your arm's fully extended, your strength is not at its greatest. And that's why arm bars work so well, because you straighten an arm out, and it doesn't have as much strength as it did when it was mm -hmm. slightly bent. So that's my take on this. Mm -hmm. when, uh, I see two stories in the same image, mm -hmm. whereas in the, the Largo play, He's got a position with a few options to play out from a little farther distance. Mm. Thank also you, Kel. Look at the crossing of the feet. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, and and uh, I don't think uh, nowadays I'm much less worried about you know these two plays kind of being similar than I used to be. Right? I used to have this, you know, this you know, attitude of, well, they must be different because there's two of them, right? I mean, what's this play must be different from this one because, well, why would he repeat it? That doesn't make any sense, right? But now I'm, you know, I'm much more cool about it. I don't think it should bother us that these two plays, which seem to have a lot in common, actually do. <laughs> uh, not sure, least, be well, yeah. The left, left arm entry, that's the same. Exactly. And that's the same throughout. You did this exactly. in Dag, you did this in Abrazari. And and you're gonna do it again in Polex. Exactly, and and not least because it definitely seems to be a theme for those of you who have kept up with this um, uh, back to the cell course thus far. Fiore is constantly repeating himself. It seems sometimes perhaps more intentionally than and than than at other times, but uh, but nevertheless, right? And you know, again, he's also a martial arts um, teacher. Uh, master, I you know, so it seems he's got his own way of looking at uh, uh, fencing and, and violence, and it's going to repeat even when he's not necessarily intending to um, to do it for teaching purposes. So, yeah, so a very similar, a very similar, maybe a little different. It's an ex it was an excellent question. By the yep, way. absolutely, absolutely.
thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, the next play, we get our first countermaster. Woo! Uh, another forked beard for the forked beard cultists out there. Um, Folio 29VB, a uh, VC in the Getty. Oh, shoot. I thought that was the spiked pommel. I was going to freak out, but it isn't. I'd like to call, I like to call this play. So you think you know the middle key? Yeah. <laughs> so you think you can middle key? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he looks really. He looks like he's frowning too. You know, he's just like, oh, you bastard. Um. All right. Um, Connor, would you like to read the text for us, sir? I am the counter, and this is how I proceed against the student that came before me, who is trying to use dagger plays against me, namely the second play after the first remedy met. I won't believe my eyes if I see the opponent still standing after I'm done. Thank you very much, Connor. Glad to have you with us. All right. Folio 29 VC. So, uh, what, what? He reversed the middle key. Oh no! <laughs> so, um, for in this play, uh, this play is reminding us um, not to be too cocky with our entries, um, specifically to make sure that entries are done in the right time, because as the as uh, our dagger study showed us, that all of these entries can go very poorly wrong. And and uh, and actually, this play ought to freak us out a little bit. I maintain. Because we, you know, we saw in Dagger that there were some amazing counters, right? Not only is it, is it you know, very tough for the unarmed person to defend themselves against the Dagger, but the counters that these Dagger Masters have are just friggin' brutal. There's like, you have to, you, you realize you have to pour every ounce of your aud uh, Audacia into this to have any hope of surviving. Especially, you know, someone who knows anything about what they're doing with the dagger, right? And this play is the first time that we see, even though, of course, we know we've known all along, that all of these dagger counters can also work with the sword in two hands. <laughs> oh, shit. So you mean we didn't leave those dagger counters behind? Those unfair, cruel dagger counters behind when we left dagger? Oh, God, no, we didn't. They're definitely here in the sword, and they're going to be in the spear and the poleaxe and in the sword in two hands as well. Uh, not so, spear. oh, okay. So I suppose, I suppose not in the, not in the spear per se, but um, they're going to come later. So, you know, uh, if we thought we left these cruel counters in the dagger section behind, we haven't. They're still they're still here, and and here he is. No, they're can they're coins to carry in our pocket as we go forward. That's right. And now the spe the specific counter that um, Fury is referring to, although actually I'm I, I'm not sure if he. Second play after the first remedy master. I think that's wrong. Hold, hold on a minute. The second play after the first. Well, he's referring to this one. Nope. Yeah, he's referring to the counter. Yeah. But because you tried the second play there. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That's what he means. Perfect. That's what he means. Right. Because so, the flick is the second play. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, so Fury is referring to there in the text um, Folio 10 VD, which is the counter to the middle key, right? And this ought to st um, stand to our reason because it definitely looks like uh, he is. Well, how how could he get into this position in the first place? He got in here because the scholar uh, here attempted a middle key, and he did it in the wrong time, uh, and uh, and he got it reversed. Right and now he got put into a lower key, um, and that's that's one of the things that you risk with middle key opportunities. Uh, although of course it's not just a lower key; it's a lower key with a sword as a lever, with <laughs> probably the the blade in your neck. So <clears throat> pass. It's a thing of beauty. Would not do again. Do not recommend. Zero stars. <laughs> Anybody have any last thoughts about this one? Nope. All right. Moving on. <gasps> another counter. Oh, boy. It's just killing it. Against another middle key player, too? Oh, boy. 
Maybe we're getting some balance on all of this middle key propaganda. Folio 29VD. Can we have um, uh, David Svetzer? Do you have the text in front of you? Can you see the screen here? Yes, I can. Would yes, you like I to read? Can. Thank you. Um, I am also the counter of the student who tried dagger plays against me. That is, I act against the student in the second play before me. Slitting his throat would be going easy on him. <laughs> and if <laughs> I want, I can also quickly throw him to the ground. I what the fuck? <laughs> Look at this, this guy. He's he's getting into it now. I I have I have this I have this fantasy that he wrote all of his sassy text in one evening, like and you know he's just he's 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 glossing the images and he's just you know anyway, um, that's for the HBO special. Okay, so Folio twenty nine VD. So like he says, he's um this is another counter to the middle key attempt that he showed earlier. So it's not following on from the play we saw before. Um, it's in addition to the play we saw before. It's a variant of the play. A variant, yeah. Yeah. So um, he could have reversed it, um, but in this case, he uh, stepped in He stepped in like this, right? Um, this so is, not much more to say. A, this is a particular case where the Zug has stepped in so deeply that he's inside the... Uh, yeah. The player, the counter master, whatever. So he's inside the center line because yeah. he stepped in so deeply with his entry. Maybe he misread the, mm. the arm being pulled back or something mm. like that, or he tried to force it. Mm -hmm. I've seen people literally duck their head down into the center when they're trying to jam their arm down to yeah. uh, the right. And, well, what a sweet place to pull your blade up when somebody jams their face into it. Yeah, that's th this is why I'm I'm constantly on about um, you know the push pull stay pressures and dagger when we do it. I really oh, I really do think that you know yes strength does have a place in martial arts absolutely and yes there are certain times when you can cause things to occur but by and large I think you're limited to doing only the things that you're presented with. You can't just do whatever the hell you want. Uh, and, 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 and for my money, actually, I think that's a relief for me. That's a, that's a giant relief because if you had to carry around the whole Rolodex of plays, every time you had to act, you'd be paralyzed. How the hell do you even function in that environment? What, 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 what's the right thing to do? You'd never know. You'd never know with any certainty, no matter how long you practice, but seeing as you shouldn't do every play in every instance, there's only really a select few that are ever on offer at any time. You don't have to remember all of the plays that exist all the time you're fencing. You just have to know where you are and remember the kind of good ones. So um, that's that's a great relief, uh, a, a, a fact about fencing that should be a relief to us, uh, especially those who are trying to mem you know learn Fury for the first time, right? Don't don't uh, get the feeling like you have to carry around all of these things in your memory every time that you fence. Nobody does that. Uh, it, it's impossible. The only difference between, you know, uh, the experienced people and the newer people is that the experienced people have these kind of unconscious kind of floating around in there. And they feel they feel when the times are right to remember this play, remember that play. They're not really doing it consciously with brain power. That'd be be crazy. No, it's 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 like pulling a card out of the deck. Exactly. Like yeah. That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, like, uh, well, there, there is, yeah, there, there is that to a degree, but I think, uh, over time, we have experience and, and have gone through many of these plays that time actually slows down mm -hmm. and you're able to recognize the opportunities yeah. quicker than your Zubidora. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your perception of time increases as you tread the same path over mm -hmm. and over again. Absolutely. Uh, you, right. see, you see where things can go wrong, you see where things can go your way, and uh, you just the, the more you play it through, even in fun with your friends, the more likely that it will come out naturally in, in earnest. Because remember, Fiori's not teaching, you know, friendly dueling. He's, he's mm -hmm. teaching fighting for his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people as outside of the Fiori community think it's all about you know, the, the dueling in a, in a legalistic sense. Well, these guys would duel out of armor. 
and this is illegal dueling, they had to go off into private places because they could be charged with attempted murder. Or, or killed, yeah, as a result of, du or, of dueling, for killed. sure, yeah. Yeah, abs yeah. absolutely. This yeah. stuff was not, a, a, it was not a legally acceptable thing like any more than the gunfight at the OK Corral was. No, this, is, this is stuff that's outside the law. And outside moral and church law as well. Oh, as that's also true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People were much more invested in their souls than we are today, on average. All right. The next one, 30RA, Folio 30RA. Uh, we got a nice goatee this time. Look at that. I just noticed that. That's nice. Uh, 30RA, who's next? Uh, uh, Gra uh, Graham. Would you like to read the text for us, sir? If I cross into close play with someone, I can immediately do this grapple to prevent him from harming me with any disarms or grapples of his own. I can strike him with thrusts or cuts without any danger. Sounds good. Wow. All right. Uh, that seems like a pretty good play then. <laughs> so what's, uh, yeah, well, this, this what's is going on? Goes, this is where it goes from the, the third, uh, or I should say the third, two, three, no, fourth play where he's of dagger, the first remedy master of dagger, mm -hmm. where you reach through, grab the wrist, and turn it to the outside. I think every scholar has done this at least once in free fencing. It For just sure. pops up over and over and over again. And once you turn that wrist to the outside, that sword is no longer an issue for you. Yeah. Yeah, this is a this is a great uh, a great play. And do do you read this as coming in um, between so he's between the arms, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it, it, a couple yeah. Two plays back, I think, is, mm -hmm. is the entry where you've got two different ways of going about it. You can mm -hmm. end up here or you can end up in the middle key. The last uh, one's what we just followed where mm -hmm. the Zugadori tried a middle key and failed miserably mm -hmm. twice. Yeah, and and so here we see a direct entry onto the um, the main hand. Um, of the uh, of the sword, it effectively paralyzes the use of the sword, and at least buys you the tempo to get your point online. Um, and as uh, David said a couple uh, plays earlier, these plays with the point online, especially uh, low like this, they're perfectly usable in armor as well as out of armor because you can come up into the armpits or underneath the. Uh, you know, the aventail or whatever neck protection you might have um, just as easily as you could uh, thrust somebody out of armor. So um, these are great, right? And, you know, it's a very, very serious threat um, to, to somebody. Um, I've seen occasionally, I shouldn't say this, but I'll say it, occasionally in class you see people have a bright idea uh, when we do this play and they'll let go with their right hand and try and do some shenanigans with their left hand. Um, just... Tell that good idea fairy to go away, because that's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, the best thing the best thing you can bullshit. do here is actually let go with your left hand. Yes, you let go with absolutely. Your left hand, then you can pass back and have a chance at getting that whole mess of the arms and the gardens and stuff. Get that back into the center line so you can't be thrust at both. Yeah, and maybe if you can try and get it, get around to his outside. That'll that'll put you at least that'll put his arm between uh, or put you between his arm and the sword. So, uh, uh, or I said that wrong, but whatever you know what I mean. To get around on this side, yeah. that might be helpful. But get the tangle across the center instead. Yeah, absolutely. Of, uh, yeah. On their side, on the you know, on, yeah. on their side of the center instead of on your side of the center where it's bad for you. Yeah. But letting go with the left hand uh, gets you out of a lot of troubles. In yeah. armor, there's a, a lot of stuff at half sword where you get the point in behind the cuff of the gauntlet. This is the solution. You let go with your left hand, the pain stops. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. All right. Any last uh, okay. comments about this one? Or questions? I, I, mm -hmm. I'm still kind of confused about the situation where this mm -hmm. would occur. Mm -hmm. The situation where this would occur? Yeah. Okay. So in. So, uh, yeah, well, let's go back to the text here, because the text is actually pretty surprising. If we read it again, if I cross into close play with someone, I can immediately do this grapple to prevent him from harming me with any disarms or grapples of his own. 
and I can strike him with thrusts or cuts without any danger. Holy sheesh. Well, that's that's a pretty strong kind of statement he makes without much additional uh, context. So, um, as Fiore says, very very straight up, if the, the, the engagement is right, if you have access to his main hand with your left hand, right, stretching straight out to Postalonga, then you can and maybe should grab it, right? Coming underneath this wrist, similar to uh, similar to the first play of the the first remedy master of dagger. And so remember, in the dagger section, your your arm here is between, or it's like uh, it's underneath the dagger, but on top of the arm, right? And in that kind of similar sense. The, your arm here is um, underneath the sword uh, hilt, but on top of the arm here. So in that in that sense, it's very similar to the the first remedy master disarm. But like the actual position of the sword, because it's kind of like pointing downwards. That's not relevant. What matters is that no, no, no. you get a grip on his right no, arm. No, no, you're missing the point. No, no. After you turned it, you, he, you've already turned the sword. Yeah. Can you go back three plays? Yeah, absolutely. In, uh, in the section? Absolutely. So here we are with this one. One, okay. two, three. There. Thirteen scholar. Look at the hands. And then we have an option. You can go to the wrist, as I said, or you can go deeper into the elbow. If the Zugadori goes deeper into the elbow, he gets punished in two different ways by the counter masters. Uh, but if he manages it, well, then he's got you in a middle key and you're done. Mm -hmm. Right. So now when we go back to assuming this is just the wrist attack. Now you skip forward three. Mm -hmm. And there's how it plays out. Make sense. So this is a continuation of the 13th scholar, basically. That's correct. OK. Yeah, you can you can. You can easily read it that way. And, uh, you know, as to exactly how to get this position, we're going to have to, you know, we have to talk about, you know, a little bit of footwork and, and weightedness and whatever. That's that's on the cell, uh, sorry, on the floor uh, a talk. We'd have to demonstrate it. But it's not that difficult to get the turn here once you have have that have that wrist. Yeah. A very simple wrist lock. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, again, once you have once you have that entry, uh, you can point the sword wherever you want, right? Here, the sword is point is in is in prime, right? It's kind of in finestra. Here, the sword is in um, low uh, serpent uh, or archer, I guess. Um, it's it's okay. Who's sword? Or, you talk or, or breve, the 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 scholar here. The scholar sword. Yeah. The scholar, the scholar sword is. I'm gonna poke you, buddy. There you go. There's no real post to like that. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, whatever, you know, the sword is pointing to the target you're, you're threatening, right? If the guy was in armor, a lower, uh, uh, the sword pointing to the, under, to the targets underneath groin. might be a little better. Um, out of armor, this is good. Gro groin, yeah. Does that answer your question? Does that kind of clarify things a bit more? Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Good question. Because it's, you know, with skipping back and forth between the plays and then spending a lot of time going back to the dagger section, of the dust, yeah. we can lose the context here. The Absolutely. Continuity, continuity of it. Absolutely. So we've seen, uh, again, thank you, Cal. We've seen um, a bit of a sequence here from 29 VB to 29 VC and VD uh, with countermasters against the middle key entries. Not that the middle key entry is bad, but if you fuck it up, then you'll regret it. Uh, which we should be used to, and then we have an example of the uh, the attack to the wrist working. And Fiore is very unequivocal about this play in this text. He says it's great. So okay, it's great. Uh, moving on. This guy, thirty R B. <laughs> I love this guy. Um, Kel, do you have the text in front of you, sir? I do. Would you like to read it? Here's how this play is done. The opponent makes a reversal Mazzano, and I make a Mazzano with my own. 
and immediately go to Cold Spray while the remaining defendant, and I whip my sword to the opponent's neck as illustrated. I can then throw him to the ground without fail. Thank you very much, Kel. All right. So um, here's where I get to have some fun and be honest. I've never understood this play, and I hate it. And someone else, someone else describe how it's done, because for the life of me, I, I, I couldn't give a great narrative if I tried. Never got this one. Um, so, you know, isn't it interesting? Now, okay, so in all, in all seriousness, so it seems, to, it seems to be that he gives explicit instructions here for this play. Mm -hmm. The opponent makes a reverse of Mezzano. I make a Mezzano of my own, and I immediately go, go to close play. While remaining defended, whipping the uh, sword to the opponent's neck is illustrated. So my c conventional reading of this would be the opponent makes a reverse of Mezzano, and I make a reverse of Mezzano of my own in order to cross it. Nope. Right? Well, well hold on. Uh, let me go through my misunderstanding oh. so uh, people who, okay. who misunderstand with me can be uh, informed afterwards. But so that's, that's how I read it, right? Because... Um, he says makes a reversal mezzano. I make a mezzano of my own. Mm, Surely it must there. be a reversal mezzano because how else would I cross it? And then he says immediately go to close play. But the problem is if I made a reversal mezzano against his there, reversal there. and crossed it, how could I end up in here where his sword is under me somehow and my sword's over uh, over his neck? So and this and this play here we are right in specific has had so many bazillion terabytes of <laughs> bandwidth spilled over the last 20 years arguing over it because people absolutely insist that Mazzani have to be parallel to the ground. We have a very strict uh, description of what a Fendente is and we have a very strict uh, description of what Sotano is. But the Mazzanos mm -hmm. are the things that go between. Mm -hmm. So if you make a mezzano, it doesn't have to be absolutely parallel to the ground. It can be a hump. It can be rising slightly from to slightly up. It can be any number of things. But this particular image shows the end of all of that sequence. So we never know what the crossing is. So he makes a reverso, which, of course, is from, say, his left shoulder or, or, or his left leg. And you cover it with a mezzano of your own, which means you're basically making a right cover. So then you step in and whip your sword around his neck. So your uh, elbow pit is into his chin, and the sword is against the back of his neck. It's it's something that I can demonstrate, but I have never ever performed in fencing, because not many people want to get that close to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, that's the only thing I can I can imagine it is because uh, I've never seen anyone else do it either. But it, it's just like I've I've thought about how how can I do this when someone makes a, a Mizano reversi against me? It's generally because something else is messed up at the beginning. It, very few people will open with a, a Mizano reversi. Mm -hmm. But in this particular case, you're going to make right cover. What I like to say is right cover because that's basically how he describes it in the PD. Uh, and then you're going to step behind him when you make your entry. You're going to step behind him with the right side of your body. You're going to hook him up like a clothesline and use your uh, sword like a scissor against the back of his neck under his left ear. Now, you can disagree with that because, quite frankly, most people do. There is no – I have never, ever seen anyone say, absolutely, this is it and this is how to do it and put it on video. It just never happened, and I've been at mm. it for 20 years. So your, uh, your unwillingness to be convinced about this particular play is very wise because most people aren't. But when you play it out according to the text, that's how it works. <laughs> well, to, to, be, to be clear, I'm not, I'm not unwilling to be convinced. I honestly have no, I have no predilections either way. I'm sure, you know, uh, you know all, all plausible narratives for me here are really good and, and interesting, right? They help me understand this play. Um, I, this is this play I really stressed out about over my free scholar test. I was, mm. pe I was petrified that I'd be grilled about this play. Uh, you should have um, done more work on the pole axe, though. But <laughs> well, you know, we can discuss the 
failures to my free scholar test at another point. And I should, and I but, should have done more work on the low. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is the, this is one of those plays I think that, um, in all seriousness, uh, people do uh, struggle with, as Cal as Cal said, not not so much struggle as in not understanding, but you know, speculate about. Um, it's a it's a bit of an odd one. The setup in the text, even though it seems specific, once you start to think about it and, and do it, it can be confusing. Um, so it's definitely a neat one to chew, uh, and, yep. and preferably in, in company, right? The, the, the great, uh, greatest number of discussions I've seen about what exactly is Mezzano have often boiled down to this play because of the way he uses the oh, text. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, no. Mm -hmm. This is very defining for what he thinks of a Mazzano, and it's a much more loose interpretation than the vast majority of us carried for a very long time, and a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of the community still carries. Um, it's good to practice Mazzano, uh, Mazzani, I should say, uh, as a parallel to the ground thing, especially since it's so useful to cut through like the neck and the hands and things like that, and it's a, a, the only way to beat a Fendente. You know, you're going to Right. And drive That's it down. Right. You don't have to bind it. Yeah. So, our understanding of Mazzano or Mazzani in particular is is really bound by this concept of parallel to the ground. And in nowhere ever, ever in any of the texts does he ever define it that way. Yeah, only only insofar as the the images in um uh in the the cuts are you know they look horizontal, but even then. But even then, to to and to double down on Kel's point, the images in the cuts, he he specifically emphasizes uh, that the uh, the targets can be anywhere from the neck to the thigh, right? Um, the path. The path. The path. The path. So he he never, you know, the Mazzani always depicted like that, but as as a yeah. hard and fast rule, yeah, and it's not. That's right. That's right. That's an assumption. How you do it with uh, with the dagger when you attack from the left with the dagger, you, you are doing a, a mezzano. Whereas for the uh, other attacks from Mandrito, he never says anything about you know path. It's a Mandrito, or Mandrito is just a Mandrito. It's it's from somewhere from yeah. your right hand. Whereas with the uh, the Sotano thrust with the dagger, it's mm. you know. It's pretty much Mazzano. It's going to be in the middle. It's not going to be a Fendente. The F we practice the Fendente from the left regularly. Yeah. But what Fiore says specifically is it's a Mazzano. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. This so, is, this isn't is that neat? A bit pedantic. Yeah. But well, my point is there is a way to play this through if you stick exactly to the text and you don't get stuck on the fact that Mazzano has to be parallel to the ground. Then this play works just fine. Well, I love the bear picture. That's great. Uh, I, I, I'm doing a lot I of that. Hmm? My interpretation of that is 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 uh, the half sword coming in at, uh, with a half sword, and then um, compressing his sword, and then placing the half sword against the net, just like it show in the illustration. I mean, Mizano is. I mean, it could be interpreted as being half of something. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I really. I. I, I, okay. I, I kind of. I, I kind of do that when I'm in armor. Oh, absolutely. And you mm. you, you, and you grip people by the head and do a quirk and try and pop the quirk all the time. Um, yeah. No, I totally agree with you there. It can't be. It could be looked at that way. But in all the other cases where he, he grabs the the sword in the middle, he always states specifically, and I put my left hand in the middle of the sword. He hmm. always says that. And, and there are numerous circumstances of it. Um, in this case, he doesn't. And though he ends up that way, it's because he's cutting to the neck. So this is the end of the play. So it's like the last sentence of the play. And uh, the only way to get there is a, a couple of middle crossings that aren't absolutely horizontal to the ground. All right. Well, let's um, we'll we'll tiptoe away from that um, one. I, I have, oh, Bruce, please, please yeah. go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, when we first learned the sword and we first learned the defenses, and we're cutting Mezzano, after a little bit, we start cutting against it from um, full iron gate. 
mm -hmm. and cutting up against a Mezzano mm -hmm. to knock it up and, and over. So uh, my understanding from what Cal just said is it doesn't necessarily have to come from that low if it's coming up at a shallower angle doing the same thing. His Mezzani is coming in from one side. My Mezzani... Okay, no. his Mezzani is coming in from his Mezzani from my right to my left, attacking my right side. Yes. My Mezzani will be moving from my right to his left and knock his sword up at an angle, at two shallow angles. Yep. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So then, having knocked his sword up and to my left, his right, his sword would then be almost in a position where if I step with my left to his sword, which is still moving backwards because I've knocked it that way. No, you step in with your right. Other than that, oh, sorry, right, I, on, I, I step, right, right on. Sorry, I step in to my, to my left with, with my right, right foot. Your, right side of your body. Yeah, okay. And you hook him up with a clothesline line on your right elbow. Huh. Okay, up until okay. the point where you said left, you were following Ooh. my idea, my concept of it. Exactly, Bruce, you had it. Um, one of the things that, that may throw some other people off there is um, if someone's cutting Fendente against you and you're in middle iron gate, you still do a Satano against their Fendente. But the Satano is not going to be, um, how to say it, as strong a beat as it would be against a Mezzano. Because you're going to have to chase their flat, whereas with the Mezzano, the flat's right there. Does that make sense? You, well, when we get when we get on farther into the Polak stuff, there's a huge paragraph about this, and it'll be clear. It'll be a lot clearer then. And all of you who are here, who I, um, of course, very much hope to see in in the flesh on the south floor, uh, maybe even in a few months' time, who knows? Uh, definitely uh, pin this, and let's make sure that we take a look at it on the on the south floor. It'll be much more fun, I'm sure. Um, yeah. All right. So moving on to the next one, I'm seeing as we're drawing near to the close of our evening, um, it's just, oh, it's always, move, always moves too fast. 30 RC. So, um, now we're moving into a sequence of four plays and I want to draw, um, Actually, this is the end of the uh, this is the end of the strato section. So, um, I'm going to give a narrative for all of the next plays that follow. Whether or not you accept it, of course, is up to you. Um, but uh, I do think the next few plays we're going to see are all connected by one important mechanic, and it's a mechanic which is actually proven very difficult for recruits uh, to do. And not that I think it's um, it's you know particularly mystical or anything, but it it does take your uh, arms, your body, and your legs to be all moving in proportion at the same time. And that's hard. It's, this is a hard thing to do, right? It's not super yeah. intuitive. And so if, the, you, yep. if you struggle to dance, if you have a lot of trouble dancing, you're going to hate these plays. Yeah. And if, you, if you're okay right. dancing, if you've had any experience, with any sort of dancing, I mean, even square dancing, this stuff will be a lot simpler because you move yourself into place and you move your arms. Your arms are going to a particular target as your feet move them to that target. Yeah. Think and, about that. And so the, the next four plays are all um, disarms, except for this one, which is just a flex finish. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's the finish of the, to this one, if I, if I recall. Um, but uh, no, no. Okay. Uh, well, I guess we'll we'll see it shortly. Um, but the disarms for these are all, um, they all follow a similar mechanic, okay? And that mechanic is, um, how to draw it? Um, okay, let's use this play here. Just, okay. So the disarm mechanic is this. Uh, ba -ba. Here we go. Okay. So... Here's the sword from a side view, right? And then here's the sword from a 
let's just say a front view, right? The mechanic is to spin the sword this way. Clockwise. Yeah. This is also the disarm for the lance, for the staff. That's right. Full axe. So it's to spin the sword this way. This is the front view. So that the pommel is coming up and over the wrist. And the sword is coming down. So that it's going to break the grip of the wrist of the of the re, of the the right main hand on the sword okay this is the mechanic of the disarm and the reason why i i want to emphasize for the next four plays this mechanic is because i don't want you to get distracted by any of the you know the circumstantial situations in these plays because this me this mechanic is the only thing that's happening in these next four plays i maintain though of course in the next four plays we're going to do this mechanic in a few different interesting ways so the first play we're going to look at is um this one and uh all without more ado let's move to it now okay but we'll we'll come back to this mechanic every in the next four plays so 30 rc uh renat would you like to read the text for us here yep please this is a high disarm i push forward with the handle while squeezing his arm with the left hand until he abandons his weapon then i can give him a good dose of strikes student after me shows the opponent's sword on the ground thank you very much sir all right so this is a high disarm. I hold my sword and push forward in the left hand, squeezing his arms to lean bandits his weapons. Then I can strike him, and um, the student after me shows the opponent's sword on the ground. So these next four plays here are all disarms at different distances. So this disarm is the closest in. It's a disarm that's almost kind of middle keying, sort of, the, the sword. This disarm is with a wrist in. This disarm is with a hand in. And then this last disarm is actually, uh, well, you, you actually drop your sword. And you, this, is, this disarm, the first entry, is with the right hand, which is really interesting. That's the one, the one that I was referring to about the entry being, the first entry being with the right hand. And that's this one. But the, the mechanic is identical um, with, with all of these. And so what does it actually look like? So let's, I want to play this video um, over a few times because um, this is a good example of what it ends up looking like. Yeah, right there. Okay. And you can do it in such a way that the sword doesn't go flying way off into the distance. That's right. You can collect it. You can collect it. Yeah. Collect it. Yeah. Collect it at the cross. Yeah. Now I do want to pick on this for one in in one sense though, and I probably shouldn't. Uh, well, is it is it worth doing? Probably not. But I'm going to do it anyway. So the the biggest mistake that people make with this disarm is they they do what this guy would do what this guy does and that is that they scoop the blade with the hilt as if it's the blade that's tearing the sword away from the hands of the enemy and the reason why this works is because this guy is doing it for the demonstration and he lets go of it and it makes it look super fancy and that is exactly how it would look if it was actually done you know per se uh properly but the re the reason that fury has the sword here uh perpendicular that's the right word yeah perpendicular to the blade is because this the the action is going to be to press down on the sword with the hilt all the way down not scooping the blade scooping the edge with the pommel or anything like that that's gonna put the sword more into the hands of the opponent it's to press with the flat of the hilt all the way down turning the sword clockwise just like this and it's that clockwise motion that will cross the arms and tear the sword out of the hands so it has nothing to do with the pommel in this in this sense 
the, you're not scooping the sword away. You're actually pressing perp, uh, perpendicularly with the flat of the hilt to the flat of their sword to get this done. Kind of towards full iron gate. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Straight uh, straight down. Um, so, uh, but again, you know, what's the point of me saying it here? We have, we have to practice it. This is something that, that you know, we'll practice a lot when we get back. Um, but this is the essence of this, uh, of this play. And also, you know, not only this play here, but we see this play, we see, we see this perpendicular structure. This play, we see this perpendicular structure. And this play, we see this perpendicular structure. So uh, if images matter, if they mean anything, that's probably important. And practice, I would uh, say, definitely shows that this is not coincidental. This drawings, it is because this is how this, this thing works. There's a really interesting uh, play at the same section of the Navadi or the Pazani Dasi, where it shows the scholar with it, an enormously long sort of elastic man arm. Uh, and it, it demonstrates the, the story, the idea that you've mm. got to reach out with your left hand. You really have to reach to mm. get there. This is not someone uh, just standing there while you jump on him. You've got to reach out with your right hand to check his arms before you can invert your sword pommel from a blade bind. All right? Yeah. Bring the thing around from a blade bind. So if you can, if you have that nobody image handy, that would be a real cool thing to look at because it's really instructive. Is it the, um, is it the, is it the same play in the Novati? It's, it's basically the same play, okay. but he's got this really, this, the scholar has this gigantic long, What's that character from the Fantastic Four that leads it? Oh, the stretch? Like rubber, Captain rubber or stretch. whatever, whatever guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mr. Stretch. Fantastic. And there you go. Yeah, the only, only way you could possibly do this, or unless you're Gumby, you know. Come on, you can do it. It's like, it's like. 30 kilobytes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Load the image. Oh, you got so many. Uh, I do have some so many, tabs uh, open. Yeah, that's fine. Open, my, yeah. my computer's just being uh, uh, yeah. anyway, complaining. If, if you can find it. There we go. Not, yeah. is, this, uh, is this the guy we're looking uh, at? No. He's got, a, he's got a really, really long stretch. All right, let, let, me, let me see the, the PD. Uh, um, I'll bring it up, Cal. Keep, talk, keep yeah, going. Yeah, it's fine. Anyways, anyways, my point is um, I teach this one in a different sequence so that it emphasizes the measure. Uh, this one flows into the, the, the blade disarm where you reach your hand forward, check their hand without really disturbing their arms. You just check the right hand of the zoo and then you swing your pommel around because once you've checked their hand, you don't have to worry about the bind anymore. You swing your pommel around and then you do the play as you, as you suggest to turn it around. But that, that's a straight takedown. And if you do that, then as you take their sword down, your blade inverts and you smash him in the face. It's it's a, a really simple follow through that happens so quickly that it's hard to cover. Um, if you are a little bit closer, then you push through and you do the single hand pommel strike. If you're a little bit closer than that, you step through with the double hand pommel strike. And then if you do uh, these you know, if you're close enough that you can grab at the arm and step in, because you've got to put your left foot in to pivot on to do a tuta volta in reverse. When you do the tuta volta, then you're taking the sword away and grabbing both his arms. And you got to be pretty close to do that. Mm -hmm. If you just reach forward, the way the image shows, if you reach forward in identical to that picture, you're going to get a sword in the face. Mm -hmm. This is a, t a moment in time. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, Mike. All of a sudden, it's loading poorly. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, why. don't worry about it. Go back to where you were going with that. Yeah. I just, ah. I like I say, I teach it in a different sequence because that way it really emphasizes the measure. If you do this play directly from a bind, trying to get your arm in over both of their arms without getting smashed in the face as you invert your sword, or getting your right hand cut off when mm -hmm. in contact with their sword, really, really hard. And I've seen students struggle with it for years so that's why i try to teach it as a measure thing as opposed to here's the first thing you start with 
Absolutely. And, you know, like we've said many times, it's a good thing that we started off our examination of Fury with Al-Brazari and with Dagger because we learned how critical uh, uh, timing uh, was for all of our Al-Brazari and Dagger actions because the time is so short, it's almost non-existent. And especially if you're doing something with this big of a commitment, hand and body, both hands, doing different things, uh, and body and foot with a rotation, you're doing all this shit all at the same time, you damn better, uh, you, you damn better pick the right time to do it. Um, otherwise, you're going you're gonna to get messed up. <laughs> yeah, quick question. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you explain what the sword uh, pommel is doing. But what's the the hand doing again? Right. So let's let's take the. I, I actually like uh, um, I like much more what he's doing here with the left hand than what he's doing with the sword. And so what he's doing with the left hand is basically what what you do. So he's got ah boo. Um, let me try and pause it again better. Oh, was that is that later? Far. It's like uh, lower the playback speed to have it be slower. Shit, I think I just I just mess, messed my place up. Okay, it's right after this one. Right. Yeah, here. Okay, perfect. So you see, so he's actually got, um, he doesn't have a double middle key because he's not on the elbows, but he's got kind of a double middle key on the wrists. Right? He's got the it's wrist. It's really hard, really hard to go all the way to the elbows. Yeah, yeah, then yeah. He's yeah. Get on the wrist. So he's got the wrists wrapped up and he can keep them. And that's the key. He can keep them, which means he can come back with pommel strikes if he wants. Or he could flip the sword around and, and try a try a strike. Um kind of whatever whatever he wants. He's in a pretty dominant position here. And this can really suck. If you squeeze this. And especially if you kind of tuta a little bit and make sure that he doesn't kind of stand back up, um, this is this is a great Abrazari position. Um, so and, and it ends up like this. It, it, this isn't you know he's exaggerating a little bit in this video, but it absolutely ends up something like this. It really sucks for the for the person. Well, that tuta volta in reverse has a gigantic amount of energy. It absolutely it does. Absolutely it does. And and for my money, the play you know uh, the, the play is clearest when it's done with that kind of energy. It's this one isn't isn't super subtle. This one is done with some some feeling. <laughs> it's explosive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's not something you want to do to people you like. No, no, absolutely not. Um, so does that kind I of answer to... your question, um, Alex? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just as a counterpoint, mm. um, or I should say, an addendum. I once did this as a demonstration at a, uh, you know, a convention seminar type of thing uh, in Lansing. And I was demonstrating this on somebody I'd known for a very, very long time in the SCA. And he was completely in disbelief that it could ever happen. And I did it to him. And we used rattan sticks so that he felt comfortable. But I did this to him. And he literally sat down on his, like squatted down on his knees and went, holy shit, my arms are killing me. Because they don't wrestle at all. They, they use all kinds of real funky sword movements and stuff that, that sometimes we would do and sometimes we wouldn't think of because they're so long. But they hit a lot harder because very few of them know what a sharp sword can do, so they treat them like clubs. But I'm telling you, the look on the guy's face when I crunched down on his, on his uh, wrist and tossed him was unbelievable because he, he didn't fall down on his face. He fell to his knees. And he was just in shock, holding his hands out as if I put him into uh, a set of handcuffs that was too small. It is a very strong play. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great one. Um, and yeah, it has to be done right at the right at the right time. Uh, the way he does it here, I think, is near. It's in the ballpark of the kind of timing situation that you're looking at. Um, if the tempo is too flat and you try to do big motions as a general rule, uh, you try to do big motions, um, then they're easy to see and counter. Right. But in this case, they kind of come to stretto and the, mom the momentum kind of carries, um, carries through, 
um, with the, uh, uh, the the scholar in black. He kind of he they come to Stretto, but he continues right away, right? And he gets to the other side, and basically, as soon as he's on the other side, he's already got the arms, and then the re the rest is just kind of uh, s expressing the play, you know. It's really so more, it, it, this, yeah. this, this ex interpretation of it is is much more Rosari than it is Strato play, like longsword play. Um, as a point of interest, I, w I sat through one of Guy Windsor's classes upon a time and he argued uh pretty convincingly that putting your pommel on the sword and trying to grip it uh is you know like by pinching the the mm. handle against the sword blade the flat of the sword mm -hmm. blade, and mm. then trying to wrench it away as you were just commenting mm -hmm. is pretty challenging and, and and doesn't really break the grip of the of the arms um if you break the grip of the arms very firmly with abrazari where you grab the sword doesn't matter. Ah, and, I see what okay. you're saying. Sure, yeah, and yeah, well, yeah. That may very well you, may be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you glide your pommel down, instead of trying to wrench it in mm. the middle here, if you glide your pommel down mm. and hook their cross above your left forearm, mm. the disarm can come off. You can maintain both swords if you wish, or mm. just drop the sword, mm. and you still throw them on their face. So yeah, sure, a, sure. A, a very, very minor difference. Mm -hmm. But as I say, this is something that Guy Windsor experimented with extensively. And he showed it in class, and I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, buddy, I'll mm -hmm. go with that. Because I've done it. And I, I do prefer to, to grab under the cross mm -hmm. than to try to wrench the sword out and around, because the sword goes flying all over the place. If it was for life, well, maybe I wouldn't care so much. But having to pro play this over and over again, if you wrench the sword in the middle you're going to have a lot of pressure on your little finger and that that side of your hand uh, of your right hand and, and it gets to be a nuisance with a sharp sword even with leather gloves on i think you'd be pretty badly cut well in, in fairness kelly anybody who's watching this take place is kind of like just they're just like nascar fans you know they're they're <laughs> they yeah, they, they accept the possibility that they could be summarily uh, uh summarily monster, decapitated <laughs> monster truck territory yeah in the crowd, you know, zero, no, it was a crash. The Twenty people died. Their baseball hats. Yeah. And uh, spit out right. their tobacco juice. All right. Well, um, it is almost ten o'clock. So rather than go through uh, a rush through the next four plays, um, maybe this is a good time to kind of pause it. Now that I've kind of given a teaser of the last four plays, it is of course the last four. Um, so next week we would be then finishing off these last four plays, these disarms, and then the the final. Um, master in stretto and then moving on to the uh the frankenstein uh bizarro plays. the bizarro plays uh which are super super fun um and, uh, and then and then we're on to the senyo which will probably take a whole section on that uh and then then we're on to the armor and stuff so uh, we're chugging right along um but of course as we do at the end of the night does anybody have any further questions or comments or whatever on any of the things we discussed today. Well, BD, well done. BD. Oh, sorry. Was somebody else going to talk there? No, oh, actually, okay. and, and I actually, uh, and let me, let me retract that before we go to general questions, usually I go down the list and, and ask the scholars if they have anything to add. So Andrew, um, BD, Connor, who else is scholars here? Yeah. So please, if you have if like to add things or subtract things, please do so. Okay. Uh, BD here. So I just wanted to comment that the initial actions of these disarms, these strato disarms, strike me as similar to the very initial actions of the first play of wrestling, coming out with the front foot, one hand low, one hand high, and of course they're similar to the um, the uh, uh, reverso dagger disarm. Cool, interesting. Yeah, I see the reverso. Uh, I, I did some for sure. Yeah, that's similar. Uh, uh, Andrew and Connor, anything to add? Uh, add here? No, nothing for oh. me. Okay. Nothing from me either. All right. Um. Well, in that case, um, 
I think we've we're nearing the end of our evening. Uh, 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 Dave, do you have anything that you'd like to add to anything we've talked about today? No, well, this this is my uh, first time I've uh, been engaged in something like this, and I think it's really well done. It's a really good idea, and I enjoyed uh, listening to the various comments and uh, and your uh, narrations and the way this is being handled. I think it's really great. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for um, for coming, Akel, as Thanks always. For joining us. Thanks yeah. for joining us, Dave. Yes. Yeah. So, um, with um, with that said, uh, it's great to see you all again, um, and uh, we'll be here again next week at 8 p.m. to uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and this recording will be up on the uh, on in the playlist in a few days. So, all of you stay safe and healthy, uh, get vaccinated, and uh, <laughs> have a great uh, have a great night. Take care, Karen. Right. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Aaron. Good night. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron.